Hey, we've got some more great news for our Patreon supporters. If you support the show for as little as a dollar a month, we have some bonus content for you. In this case, it is a recording of John Bennett Shaw from 1986 giving a talk. It's about 12 minutes worth of material, and it is definitely worth the price of admission. If you're not yet a supporter, just go to IHearOfSherlock.com and hit that Become a Patron button. You'll be glad that you did. Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is brought to you by MX Publishing, with the largest catalog of new Sherlock Holmes books in the world. New novels, biographies, graphic novels, and short story collections about Sherlock Holmes. Find them at mxpublishing.com. And by Dan Andriaco's Sebastian McCabe and Jeff Cody Mystery Series. The latest title, No Ghosts Need Apply, drops on September 28th. Find out more at danandriaco.com. And by the Wes Express, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wesexpress.com. I hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 224, The Shaw 100. I hear of Sherlock Everywhere, since you became astronomer. In a world where it's always 1895, or comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. <laughs> The game's afoot as we discuss goings-on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the Baker Street Irregulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Bert Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Well, well, welcome once again to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, are you feeling 100 yet? Yes, I am feeling 100, and it's wonderful. You know, you know, Scott, 100 is the new 90. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait to be 90 again yeah. uh, when I reach 100. Well, you know, it, it strikes me as uh, interesting. We, we chose a show title with a number in it, um, and it might be confusing for people. This is episode 224, but we're talking about the Shaw 100. Um, I was told there would be no math. <laughs> I, uh, I don't well, know. Well, if you divide the 224 by 100 and carry the square root of pi... One of the things you'll find is that you'll still be hungry after lunch. I, I can understand that. I can understand. Well, uh, if you are joining us after our previous episode where we talked about Sherlock Holmes and silent films, particularly the uh, Illy Norwood films with uh, Russell Merritt, thank you for uh, your feedback. The silence has been deafening of uh, <laughs> of feedback. Um, but we did have a number of people who wrote in to try and answer our canonical couplet quiz. And we will come to that after the interview. So stay tuned if you would like to hear If You Won and for another opportunity to win a prize. So stay tuned. <laughs> Well, Tim Johnson has been with us here before on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. He's one of the curators in the Archives and Special Collections Department at the University of Minnesota Libraries. He's responsible for the University Library's main rare book collection and dozens of special collections. The one in particular we're interested in is where half of his time is spent as curator of the Sherlock Holmes Collections. It's the largest gathering of Sherlock Holmes materials in the world. Now, Tim began his career as an instructional services librarian and has also served as a library director, director of archives, a medical librarian, 
assistant and associate professor. In addition to his curatorial responsibilities, he served for 10 years as an adjunct faculty member in the MLIS program at St. Catherine University, where he taught a graduate-level course in preservation management. Tim is happy to answer questions and help out with matters related to old books or any other question people might have about special collections or rare materials. And his blog, whose name I adore, highlights new acquisitions or other matters related to special and rare items. And because it's based in Minnesota, it's called, you ready for this? Special and Rare on a Stick. You can also you can also follow Tim on Twitter. His handle is at UMN Bookworm. Tim Johnson, welcome back to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Bert. That's a very kind introduction. Well, hey, you wrote it. I mean, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just reading. <laughs> and we and we have just finished the Minnesota State Fair. Although, I will have to say, I did not go this year. Oh. Um, there were some concerns uh, with the pandemic, and it, attendance numbers were generally down. But it is one of those things. If you can be in Minnesota at the end of August, early September, uh, do not miss the Minnesota State Fair. It is. Everything on a stick. <laughs> well, that, and that brings me to, um, you know, where we are here talking about Sherlock Holmes. If you had a Sherlockian item to place on a stick, what would you choose? Oh, well, you know, the first thing that popped to mind was William Gillette on a stick, but I don't know how, <laughs> you, how you would do that. Um, maybe um, find another version of uh, Shaw's chocolate sherlock and put that on a stick of course it's you know the state fair everything's got to be deep fried too so it would it would be a sherlockian chocolate covered in uh, deep fry batter and uh let the chocolate melt inside that and that might be a really tasty treat i i'm on board wow, for that. i like that yeah my cholesterol mm. numbers are going up just by listening oh, right. to you Right through the roof or over the Reichenbach, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Well, appropriate, you should mention John Bennett Shaw. And I, I should mention to folks, uh, as I uh, uh, remarked in your introduction, you've been on the show before, um, both times related to something uh, in, the, in the core of the Minnesota Sherlockian movement. The last time we saw you or heard from you, you were uh, on with Julie McCurris for episode 185. And we talked uh, together about William S. Baring Gould, a giant in the Sherlockian world, and the editor of the original annotated Sherlock Holmes. He, of course, was a native uh, Minnesotan. And you had your uh, first go around with us on episode 67, where we talked about the entirety of the special collections uh, there at the university library, specifically the Sherlock Holmes collections. Um, and, and this is where it brings us into connection with the subject of our talk today, John Bennett Shaw. So for our listeners who are not familiar with the Sherlock Holmes collections at the University of Minnesota Libraries, can you help us understand their origin and, and possibly what the scope is? Yeah. Um, it, it, in some ways, the story of the collections goes back prior to its founding um, at a lunch that five University of Minnesota faculty members had in 1947, where over lunch they discovered they had a shared interest in Sherlock Holmes and decided, well, what are we going to do about this? Um, they ended up writing to New York, asking permission to form a science society of the Baker Street Irregulars. And on a very cold uh, January evening in 1948, the very first meeting was held of what became known as the Norwegian Explorers of Minnesota. And one of those founding members was E.W. McDermott, who served in any number of capacities at the university. But one of them was as university librarian. He was also on the faculty um, of the library school, which is actually where I first met him. 
Um, I was sitting in a class and there happened to be a door open in the hallway uh, to another room across the hall. And here was this fellow back in the stacks. And my professor turned and looked. He said, oh, that's just McDermott with his Sherlock Holmes. Um, Anyway, you know, kind of move, jump ahead a number of decades from the late 40s to the mid 70s when McDermott was moving towards his retirement. And he was also volunteering, working in special collections and rare books. And one of the things I haven't found, I'm, I don't know if it's even there, is a piece of paper that suggests what I think McDermott maybe whispered in the ear of my predecessor, Austin McLean, which was, wouldn't it be nice if the university had a, a fine collection of first editions of the Sherlock Holmes stories? And uh, however that came about, a decision was made to go and and find a collection. James Eraldi, uh, an irregular in New York City, was selling a part or maybe most of his collection. And in uh, 1974, the university acquired the James Eraldi collection. And that's so that's the beginning. So we're actually coming up here in a few years on the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Sherlock Holmes collections at the university. Jump ahead four years, um, and the university receives a gift, uh, an amazing gift from one of those Norwegian explorers. Um, and it's a gift from um, Philip and Mary Kaler Hench. Now, Dr. Hench was a Mayo rheumatologist. He shared the Nobel Prize in 1950 in medicine. Uh, he and Mary uh, amassed an amazing collection of Sherlockiana. Um, sadly, he died in 65, um, so he was not around when the gift was given, but Mary gave the gift on behalf of both of them to the university. And this was a gift that included uh, four manuscript pages from the Hound, um, over 250 or so sketches and drawings by Frederick Dorr Steele, um, some other uh, amazing rarities. Um, now, when the Hench collection came in 78, it was like the Sherlockian world sat up and took notice and said, oh, what's going on in Minneapolis? Um, and one of those people who sat up and took notice was a fellow by the name of John Bennett Shaw. Um, now, Shaw had the largest private collection of Sherlockiana at the time. Um, and he came to the Twin Cities to look at the Hench and Eraldi materials. And the university did something rather clever. We're not always known for our cleverness. Um, but the university um, named John Bennett Shaw a special research fellow. And my understanding is that this decision had to go all the way up to the Board of Regents to make this um make this title uh, active with Shaw. And he was invited to uh, give some lectures, which he did. And while he was doing that, um, McDermott and others uh, also had conversations with, with John about what was going to happen to his collection. And by 1983, um, John Bennett Shaw had decided that, yes, indeed, his collection would come to the University of Minnesota. Um, the original agreement was that it would come uh, after his death. He later changed that provision, and uh, the collection arrived in 1993, a year before uh, we lost John Bennett Shaw. Um, there's a lot more kind of in that story. I think there were visits by McDermott and another one of the founders of the Norwegian Explorers, Bryce Crawford, um, to Shaw's uh, home and library in Santa Fe. Um, uh, but John also did an amazing thing. Once his decision was made, um, he became an ambassador for the collections and started going around and talking to other friends, basically saying, you know, my collection's coming to Minnesota. I think yours should too. And one of the arms he twisted was Edith Miser, the woman um, 
And uh, we have a, an amazing recording of the two of them, uh, John and Edith, who traveled to the Twin Cities, to Minneapolis, and uh, the Norwegian Explorers and the Friends of the Library hosted an event that marked um, the acquisition of the Edith Miser collection, which included um, most of her original scripts that she did of the Sherlock Holmes radio programs in the 30s and 40s. Um, and there were other collections that came because of John Bennett Shaw. Um, you know, he was, some have described him as the, uh, the Johnny Appleseed of the Sherlockian world, uh, going around spreading the gospel of Holmes, um, um, doing all of these things to promote, uh, and excite people about who Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, uh, were. Um, so that's a little bit of a, of a, very thumbnail uh, history of the collections and and how John Bennett Shaw entered into the picture. Yeah, that, I think that's a, a great summary, uh, Tim. Very thorough. And and if folks would like to learn more specifically about John Bennett Shaw, we do have an episode uh, where we talked about him. Uh, Jim Hawkins, who runs the Friends of John Bennett Shaw group on Facebook and has a uh, a, a website dedicated to John Bennett Shaw. He was our guest on episode 171. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. So if you want to go back and listen to more Shaw background, that's a great place to do it. And and Jim has been a delight to to uh, to work with and to watch him develop that site. It it really is a, a wonderful resource. Yeah, and he's he's clearly having a, a great time with it. Now before before we leave the subject of Shaw, I just want to make sure we we uh, uh, put a nice a coda on this, Tim. When John's collection was shipped up to Minnesota from New Mexico, um, I understand it took an entire trailer to haul his material out. Um, how many boxes of stuff were there? Well, you know, the uh, the rumor is that there were at least 221. Um, and uh, also a rumor that it was more than one truckload that there may have been multiple truckloads wow. um <laughs> it it was a, a major undertaking um to because you know anyone who visited john at santa fe knew that his bookshelves were at least double stacked if not triple stacked in places and you know um an, an amazing amazing collection but yes it, it took multiple loads i'm thinking of that um uh, that cartoon drawing, I think, in relation to Doyle, where there's a large pile of things that Doyle is sitting by. And Holmes is just, you know, one little piece of that large, um, massive uh, work. But, uh, you know, in John's case, it was everything related to Sherlock Holmes, Watson and their world. And uh, so, um, I, you know, I can't give you an exact answer of how many trucks, how many boxes, but... It was a lot. So, Tim, what is the path from this massive collection to a list of 100? And, and where where'd that idea come from? And, and what was what was supposed to be on that list? Well, you know, it it springs from the workshops that John did. Um, and sadly, I never had a chance to meet John. He was gone by the time I arrived at Minnesota. I did meet uh, Dorothy. Roe Shaw and other members of the Shaw family. Um, but the idea, and it's interesting in terms of timing, because we did this exhibition in the summer of 2001 in conjunction with um, the Norwegian Explorers and the Friends of the Library. And it, it actually marks uh, almost the, the formal beginning of what became the triennial conferences that we've hosted in Minnesota every three years. Um, but for this particular conference, uh, we wanted to um, focus on John Bennett Shaw's list of 100 and give people a sense of the excitement of collecting and also how Shaw's list uh, changed over time, um, depending on, on new works um, that came into being. And uh, and so we developed the, the exhibition and the catalog with that kind of change in mind about how 
uh, how things uh, went over the years as Shaw developed the various uh, versions of his list. Um, let me just read the opening. This is from Shaw's introduction that he gave to the 1979 list. It gives a little bit of background. It says, some years ago, I staged an exhibition of what I then considered to be the 100 basic books, pamphlets, and periodicals relating to Sherlock Holmes. The catalog of this display was never issued, and over the years, I have had many requests for the list, especially from new recruits to the cult. I love that. I thought that this workshop would provide a good opportunity to publicize such a list, and so I provided a copy to each participant to guide him, and we would add her or they, through the welter of words that have been printed about Mr. Holmes, his life and time and career, his friends and enemies, and his standing today as a figure that lives and is revered and respected throughout the world. So, so that's the opening of his introduction from the 79 uh, list. He goes on to say that he, the items uh, would give an in-depth view of the entire Homesian culture and that selection was difficult, and I'm sure that a number of important items have been omitted, and some included that many will think better left out. So even Shaw himself had this sense of how this list might change over time. Um, so that that was the core of the idea behind the uh, 2001 exhibition. Um, I had fun doing that one, too. I'm, I was just remembering um, part of the way that... Um, I framed the uh, the design of the exhibit was to not worry about condition so much. You know, as collectors, we often want that that pristine copy, that copy that's got a beautiful association with somebody. Um, but I know that in at least a few of the cases I had, I had tattered copies with torn dust jackets. And at least one case, it was like I had just dumped the contents right into the case. It was just kind of scattered all over the place to give you a sense of kind of this frenetic energy that sometimes goes into collecting um, and I'm reminded of an image of one time going booking with the late Alan Mackler, another key uh, person in the story of the Minnesota collections. And Alan had this little headlamp, this miner's lamp like that he would wear and to get down. He'd be on all fours down on the lower shelves with that miner's lamp on just so he could see because not every bookshop is well illuminated. Uh, but Alan was ready for all contingencies. And course he was i think engaged with much of what was in the shaw 100 as well now let me let me just ask you a follow-up question here about the shaw 100 a fundamental follow-up question that might seem a little odd to people how many items are on the list of the shaw 100 (laughs) <laughs> Bert, that's like asking what time the midnight buffet is on your cruise. Uh, you know, and um, my I, I'd have to go back and, and look at the catalog in depth. But my recollection from from doing that exhibit was, in the end, the Shaw 100 actually consisted of closer to 129 or 136 separate items. Um, again, giving a sense of how the, the list changed over time um, and, as Shaw added and, and deleted things from each version. Well, you may recall us speaking to playwright David McGregor here on episode 140. The good news is our friends at MX Publishing now have some of David McGregor's work in stock. Three new books by David McGregor, including Sherlock in Love, the Holmes Adler Mysteries. These are a triptych of plays that first appeared at the Purple Rose Theater in Chelsea, Michigan. The Adventure of the Elusive Ear, The Adventure of the Fallen Souffle, and The Adventure of the Ghost Machine. All three are creative and bring Holmes into contact with other people whom you may have heard of, including Vincent Van Gogh. Auguste Escoffier, and Tesla and Edison. Adding to the other group of books is David's two-volume series, Sherlock Holmes, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. 
In these books, David takes us on a journey through the late 1800s, early 1900s, through the end of the 20th century and into the 21st, as Sherlock Holmes has been played by so many different actors and was brought to life by so many different forces. David takes us through these various times and introduces us to names that you may be familiar with and names that may be new to you. All three of these books are available at mxpublishing.com today. Now, another thing that's important, too, about the Shaw 100 is how John himself organized it. Um, So he started out with the canon, and uh, there were only two entries in in that section, the canon. Um, The original one included... Baring Gould's annotated Sherlock Holmes. But then, interestingly enough, later on, he added the Baker Street Dozen, which was a publication done by two of our Norwegian explorers, P.J. Doyle and E.W. McDermott. Um, After that, he has a section on the canon abridged, um, and there's only one item there, um, William Kottmeyer's The Cases of Sherlock Holmes. Then he went into the Apocrypha, followed by um, Sherlock Holmes' general writings about. So we have some of the kind of the biographies that show up there. And that's actually a fairly extensive section of things about Sherlock Holmes. Then we get to what he called the agent. So things about Doyle. Bibliography and chronology. Theater and which was then later expanded to the performing arts in the 1983 revised list, specialized items, which might include things like uh, Julian's, Julian Wolf's Sherlock Atlas, Sherlock Holmes Atlas, parodies and pastiches kind of at the tail end of the list. And then finally periodicals. So Baker street, Gasogene, Baker street journal, miscellany, uh, the Pontine Dossier and the Sherlock Holmes Journal were the ones that were in that particular section, and which, by the way, never changed. Uh, he always had those uh, titles in the periodical section. So that's how he divided up the list. Mm. And do you know or do, has there been any conversation or talk? Are there people today who are diligently working to – ensure that they have the Shaw 100 in their personal libraries? And is that, is that possible? Or if it, well, I imagine it's possible if you have unlimited funds, but has anybody put a price on it and said, you know, gee, if you want to build the Shaw 100 today, just write me out your check for $29,000 and it'll be yours. Yeah. You know, I think in some ways um, the Shaw 100 represents an earlier time of collecting when where things were a little more affordable. I'm looking, for instance, at, and, and this is an answer, Bert, to your earlier question. I have 130 items on this in this catalog. So um, that that is the total number. But item number 125, for in, instance, is the unique Hamlet, um, which was a very private, limited publication um, almost impossible to find today. So, um, you know, I think in an earlier time when Shaw was doing his workshops, um, a lot of these materials uh, were more readily and cheaply available, and it did guide a lot of collectors. Um, There are probably a few still out there who would use this as kind of a core guide, but it, it also argues, as I think Shaw would argue, that the list can change. Um, there's a whole group of stuff that Shaw was never aware of. It didn't exist at the time, which was all of the things that have been created since DeWall finished his bibliography, The Universal Sherlock Holmes, in 1994, um, same year that Shaw passed away. You know, all the fan fiction, um, all the things that appear on archive of our own, all of the um, other kinds of parodies, pastiches, artwork, um, animations. There's a, there are whole categories of works that didn't exist when Shaw was doing this list. And for me, that's exciting. It, it speaks to the vitality of 
uh, the Sherlockian world and and people's engagement with it creatively. Mm. Now, knowing Shaw as you do, or at least knowing his history as you do, Tim, um, how do you think John Bennett Shaw would go about putting together a list in the current day and age? I mean, uh, if we can just put aside uh, the fact for a moment that he would probably be having a major heart condition or nervous breakdown trying to keep <laughs> up with everything. Um, what do you think, as a as someone who is trying to introduce new people to the world of Sherlock Holmes, would he still have capped it at plus or minus 100, or would it have just been an exhaustive list powered by the Internet? You know, I think there's something to be said about a limited list. So I, I think Shaw, being also the good Catholic that he was, would see the discipline uh, and, and appreciate, you know, um, this this work uh, uh, that's both work and prayer, as it were, in the Sherlockian sense. Um, so I think I think he would have still engaged in something like this. But I think it's also important to think that this list, these lists that that John did, are in a social context. And John was a very sociable person. And I think a lot of what shows up in the list is because he's having conversations with people. He's doing not only the workshops, but he's traveling far and wide, visiting science societies, uh, finding out over drinks what people are reading, uh, what they're viewing, what they're listening to. Um, and so I think if John were doing this and were with us and doing this today, it would be a very, very much a social construct um, based on those rich, rich relationships that he had across the entire Sherlockian universe, um, which again, I think speaks to the, to the warmth and fellowship of, of this person that we so admire, um, but also how he would have thought creatively of any other later additions to, uh, to this list. It's yeah. what people are, are doing, how they're engaging the world. Yeah. He'd, he'd love Facebook. <laughs> he would be updating hourly. <laughs> he would He'd be the king of Sher of Sherlockian, Sherlockian social pages. media. Yeah. 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 yeah, he'd be he'd be right there in the center of the strangers room. Um, <laughs> wow. So, uh, Tim, can you can you talk a little bit about the differences in the different editions when when John made these revisions? Um, what are some you know, hallmark moments of, of, of new items that appeared on there that we would now look at and go, well, of course that should have been on there. Or, uh, aha, this is when that actually made its appearance into the world in general, and John recognized it. Can, can you talk a little bit about some of those changes between editions? Yeah, um, and I, I don't have the exact years associated with when these are changed, when these changes are made. But it's interesting as I look back at the catalog, um, which, by the way, is online. So I'll provide you with a link so that you can put that in the program notes if people want to download it and, and look at it. Um, but it was interesting the way I developed the catalog and the kind of markings I used that uh, – titles that were added to the list and then survived later cuts or titles that were consolidated um, somehow. Um, some that are the unmarked ones that survived all the the revisions and then others that were cut from the list. So, you know, under the Apocrypha, for, for instance, uh, Doyle's Tales of Terror and Mystery survive all of the all of the various revisions. But later on, he also adds Jack Tracy's Sherlock Holmes, The Published Apocrypha, and uh, The Final Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. So those are publications in the from the early 80s. Um, when we get into the works about Holmes himself, um, Bill Blackbird's Sherlock Holmes in America is something that's added to the list. Um, Richard Lansling Green's The Sherlock Holmes Letters actually gets cut from the list, which is surprising given given Richard's uh, standing. Uh, Trevor Hall's The Late Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Other Literary Studies doesn't make uh, later cuts. Um, David Hammer's The Game is Afoot 
gets added in, as does Michael Hardwick's The Complete Guide to Sherlock Holmes. But Michael Hard Michael and Molly Hardwick's The Sherlock Holmes Companion doesn't survive um, uh, later cuts, uh, changes to the list. Um, a title that gets consolidated, that's Michael Harrison's It's I, Sherlock Holmes. Um, and Shaw notes in his 1987 list that this title could be substituted for the world of Sherlock Holmes. So even as Shaw is, is developing the list, he's he's also making little notes about um, things that could be considered as a substitute. Paul Herbert's The Sincerest Form of Flattery is something that is added to later lists and survives than all of the, the later cuts. Um, John Lellenberg's uh, Dear Starrett, Dear Briggs um, gets added, as does Eli Lebo's uh, Dr. Joe Bell, model for Sherlock Holmes. That's not in the original list, but it gets added in. So, you know, you go through and you see all these interesting things. James Montgomery, Silence on Sherlock Holmes, doesn't make a later cut. Um, the Norwegian Explorers Cultivating Sherlock Holmes does get added in. So, um in a way, the list is also an interesting um, kind of uh, indication of how that world is changing and how things are coming, bubbling up new publications um, as, as Shaw's doing all of these lists. I just glanced at another one that survived all the cuts, and it's one of my favorites, Dorothy L. Sayers' Unpopular Opinions. That's in there from the beginning. It never leaves. And, you know, it's interesting, too, to see the uh, publications of a number of the early uh, scion societies of the Baker Street Irregulars that appear. Uh, You've got, uh, well, certainly um, the Five Orange Pips of Westchester County, the Norwegian Explorers, the Speckled Band. Uh, this this kind of stands as a testament, as you said, of this social construct of John making his way across the country, meeting different people, finding these publications, whether they're well known to the Sherlockian community at large or whether they're buried in little cities and towns across the country. And it's also a way, I think, you know, as you look at all the changes that get made to the list over time, the things that survive, all of those cuts, you know, the things done by Edgar Smith, um, they're there from the beginning. Um, Vincent Sterrett's Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, that's there from the beginning. Um, um, Yeah, John Dixon Carr's The Life of Sherlock Holmes. You know, and that, you know, that again raises for me questions. There are things on this, in this catalog, um, again, that didn't exist, uh, it come along later. Uh, I'm thinking of the compilation of all of Doyle's letters that uh, John Lullenberg and, and others did. Hmm. You know, that's not on the list because it doesn't get published till till after John leaves us. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, I'm just having fun going through the list and looking at yeah. it. <laughs> no, it's like, it's like revisiting old friends, isn't it? It really is. Yeah, it really is. You know, and I'm, I was encouraged too as I was working on this and as I look at it, look at it again, how even the categories change uh, to some extent, especially, you know, John starts with just theater, um, but then expands that to the performing arts. Um, so you get not just theater, but you know, everything else in that realm is now fair game. And uh, he's got Sherlock Holmes on the screen. Uh, from the beginning, um, but there are other things that get that get added in, like the films of Sherlock Holmes by Chris Steinbrunner and uh, Norman Michaels. Um, well, it's yeah. also it's also obvious when you look at this. You know, his enthusiasm and delight in things played a role in what made it to the list. So, for example, the last item, number one hundred on the list, is Eve Titus's Basil of Baker Street. <laughs> yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. And before that, Sherlock Holmes Bridge Detective by, <laughs> by Frank Thomas. I would not have thought. And Dining that, with uh, Sherlock Holmes, that's another one of those specialized yes, items. Yeah, yeah, so. by Julia Rosenblatt and, yeah. and Fritz Sinchard. Uh, yeah. yeah. Sherlock Holmes in Music. Um, that's a classic. Though. Yeah, or, yeah. Uh, now, Tim, these, these revisions were done uh, during John's lifetime. 
If there were someone to come along today, and uh, you know, I don't know who that might be. I mean, there's a lot of uh, Sherlockian scholars who have the breadth of understanding of our hobby, um, and and also know you know what's important to a cornerstone library. What are some of the items that you think would be placed on the Shaw 100 list of today? Well, for one thing, I think that performing arts cattle cal- category would explode. Um, you know, I it you know John worked, I think, primarily in a print environment, and so much has changed. Um, and so much of the content we take in is through podcasts like this um, or uh, online. So, yeah, there's your little advertisement there. <laughs> this, you know, we just added um, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere to the newly revised Shaw 100. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, I think that's a category um, that while Shaw attended to it um, – there's so much more that has has appeared. Um, you know, what do you do with all of the television shows, the movies, the things that are you know that are appearing um, not in the, in this country but around the globe um, that people might not be aware of? You know, in some ways we might critique this earlier list as something that's you know focused in some ways on both sides of the pond. And doesn't take in, and John acknowledges that in the in the introduction. He said there are other creators, you know, in Japan and elsewhere that we certainly must consider. You know, and I think um, any any new list would be a much more global list. Um, it would include works from um, Japan and elsewhere in that part of the world. It would include some Russian material um, because, again, I think. Be- the the world of Sherlock Holmes, um, the gal- it's it's an expanding universe, mm. um, and and any any new list would have to take that into account. So I think there would be a lot of non print or electronic versions of things that would find their way into a new list. You've heard them on here before, and now they are back. It is the Sebastian McCabe Jeff Cody Mystery Series by Dan Andriaco. You've heard of the novels No Police Like Holmes, Holmes Sweet Holmes, The 1895 Murder, and more. Well, they're back on September 28th with the latest title, No Ghosts Need Apply. Sherlock Holmes, of course, said to Dr. Watson, the world is big enough for us. No ghosts need apply. But McCabe and Cody, well, they don't have a choice when a popular reality TV show comes to their native Erin, Ohio, to record a Halloween special about some entity that's disturbing the local gastropub known as the Speakeasy. What was expected to be some fun publicity for the pub turns into a nightmare after someone is shot to death one night in the same place and in the same way as Jackie O'Brien almost 100 years earlier. The police chief recognizes this is Mac and Jeff's kind of case, but they're forced to become virtual sleuths for most of the time when the restaurant and most businesses are shut down because of covid Before he solves the murder and a second homicide, Mac makes an embarrassing blunder in one lesser case and scores a great triumph in another. Make sure you check out No Ghosts Need Apply by Dan Andriaco at danandriaco.com today. Based on your experience as a curator and as someone who thinks about how to um, how to arrange and present things to people in a way that is um, enjoyable and consumable right that isn't overwhelming um, what does the curator in you say about the potentiality of a list 
or let me let me just say this a, a number of lists that are categorized by medium right so if if there was a shaw 100 um you know, reference library list or a Shaw 100 um, pastiche list, a Shaw 100 screen list. W- would that help us kind of approach the uh, uh, organizing the great entropy that the Sherlockian world has become? You know, I think in, in one way it would. It would it would allow us a larger net to capture these things. The The danger, the flip side of this is it, has the potential to create silos in the Sherlockian community. And so we get so focused on one particular silo of content, we forget about uh, what else is out there. Um, And, you know, in your intro, you also mentioned the preservation management course that I taught at St. Kate's. Uh, And that for me as a curator is also a growing concern that there's a lot of stuff that has appeared online that is Difficult, if not impossible, to find these days. There, my worry is that there's going to be, if there not already is, a digital black hole in the content that we have access to. And that, you know, for professions that I work with, for instance, in history, they're going to have a very difficult time um, finding source material um, that was created digitally and but no one attended to its preservation. And I think that's, you know, that's going to be true in the Sherlockian universe, too, is that there are going to be some great works um, that have been created on digital platforms that we won't be able to, to get access to because the software's disappeared or the links have rotted or any number of other things that might explain. Um, so, yes, we can make a bigger net. We can create these these categories, uh, the Shaw list of 100 for film and television animation however you want to kind of divide the pie but i think the 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 beauty of shaw is what he's always in conversation with everybody um and that's what you know i would want to see in any any new uh, manifestation of this is that it's it's a community in conversation and it's a community that's not building walls between these silos they're breaking down the walls and allowing broad exploration and enjoyment of of all this content that has come to be well it sounds like you've described i hear of sherlock everywhere <laughs> <laughs> There's another plug. Yeah. <laughs> now, well, that's, it's amazing how those keep popping up. I know. Yes. I know. Well, you I know, mean, promotion is key in this new environment. Sure. You've got to wave well, we your can, flag. You've got to be out yeah. there. Um, we can take care of that in editing. We can add more. <laughs> yeah, well, we can always add more. Um, but, you know, it, it, it strikes me, Tim, that what you just said about the black holes, the disappearing content, you know, this is important. And we're, we're starting to think about what the future of uh, this show looks like. We are desperately going through our back archives and getting transcripts of all of our previous episodes. So God forbid people can't listen to our mellifluous tones. Uh, they can actually read what uh, what happened on the show. Um, and, and another plug, uh, folks, if you haven't uh, become a Patreon sponsor of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere yet, here's an opportunity for as little as a dollar a month. You can hit that Become a Patron button on our site. Uh, it helps us to uh, tackle things like transcripts and hosting and other things into the future. So, And I would, I would also throw into this mix, um, we're not often – aware when we're creating content about its accessibility. So things like transcripts and captions and other things that allow, again, a full audience participation. We're, we're not always attentive to those things that uh, increase, improve the accessibility of our content. And mm-hmm. I think good Sherlockians would do that. That's a great point. That's a great point. Well, Tim, um, any closing thoughts on this topic? I mean, we've covered an awful lot from the origins of the Sherlock Holmes collections at the University of Minnesota Libraries up through uh, where uh, a, a curator of tomorrow, a Sherlockian curator of tomorrow might be thinking. And Any closing thoughts for us? I, I think for me, uh, in the end, it comes back to um, 
the testimony that Shaw gave us of the importance of community uh, and of con- being in conversation and the joy that that brings, um, the joy of collecting. I mean, he loved to share things from his collections with others. If yeah. um, And so all of this, this rich legacy and life that was John Bennett Shaw, I think, lays down so many good markers for us um, to follow uh, in terms of engaging in community in in those rich conversations, those times around the table that, you know, we haven't had to have, we haven't had so many during the pandemic. And so many of us long for those times again, uh, just to be together, uh, mm-hmm. to share a drink, to share a meal, to tell stories. Um, that was all Shaw. Um, and, and, it lives and breathes in his list of 100, um, but it, I think it also points the way uh, for how we continue this this very fun, engaging uh, time together in the Sherlockian world. Well said. And Tim, thank you once again for joining us here around our virtual table, and we look forward to having you on again at some point in the future. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed it. What a great conversation with Tim. It's great to explore the culture of, of all of this. You know, what you have in the Shaw 100 is a guide to the culture of Sherlock Holmes. It's not just reading the stories, but it's the commentary. It's the related areas. It's Holmes and popular culture. But how are you? I mean, you are m- much more of a collector than I. Did you ever set out to uh, tick the list? Okay, I got to acquire <laughs> Acquire these hundred things? Uh, not exactly. I mean, I, I use it more as a a, a, a guidepost, you know, kind of as a, a, a way marker for me. Um, you know, obviously, I'm not going to be able to get uh, a copy of the unique Hamlet, uh, although I have seen Starrett's own copy of the unique Hamlet in a collector's home, uh, inscribed to his mother, as a matter of fact. Um, but there are things that you know I've uh, I've looked at and I said, well, I, I might like to have that someday. And if I happen to run across it at the mysterious bookshop or another rare book dealer, uh, or I find on ABE Books or something like that, I'll grab it. But uh, it isn't one of these things where I feel like I have to check off every single thing on the list. Mm. It just it helps me kind of keep my sanity in terms of well, do I have this? Do I not? Is this important? Is that not? I think everyone deserves to make their own Shaw 100, you know, using that as maybe the cornerstone for a lot of it and picking and choosing what matters to you and then adding other ones in that are of import. Yeah, I think that's very, that's very well said. I'm pleased to see that I have, you know, many of the items. I haven't done it. I haven't printed out the list and ticked things off, but I've got many of the items uh, that are on the shore 100 because like, as you just said, you know, there are things that I came across and I said, Oh boy, this is really great. So that's cases where our tastes aligned with John and people who have expanded the list. That's a lot of fun. Yeah, it is. And before the next episode airs, I want you to print that list out and check off all the things you have and get it back to me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's the assignment. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> Actually, you know what? It might be fun to do that. Uh, the The link we have from Tim, and there's some 130 items on there. I, I think I'll go through it just for just yeah. for uh, giggles and see what I come up with, and then we can compare numbers in the next episode. Oh, good. Okay, let's do that. I was I was initially suggesting that kind of tongue in cheek as a homework assignment, but uh, this might be kind of fun. Yeah, because Sounds we don't have enough to do already. No, no, no. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Doc. Uh, are you telling me that you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? The way I see it, if you're going to build a time machine into a car, why not do it with some style? Well, that's exactly what the Wes Express has done. Built a time machine in style to take you back to 1986 and the first issues of the Sherlock Holmes Review. 
groundbreaking interviews with Jeremy Brett and Peter Cushing, rare reprints from the Strand magazine, like A Day with Dr. Conan Doyle and a profile of William Gillette as Sherlock Holmes. All four issues of Volume 1, almost impossible to find today, can be yours, reprinted in a handsome 7x10 volume. Take a trip back to the Sherlockian fever of the 1980s. With the Sherlock Holmes Review Anthology, Volume 1, available right now at wessexpress.com. All right, everyone knows what that is. It's everyone's favorite Sherlockian quiz show. Yes, I'm talking about canonical couplets, where we give you two lines of poetry, and you have to give us the Sherlock Holmes story that we are referring to. Now, if you were here with us the last time around, you heard us give you this clue. The new cook reads a magazine. The breakfast eggs are hard. A string, a stone, will soon explain the stonework's missing shard. Bert, do you know the name of the Sherlock Holmes story we're looking for this time around? Yes, I do. That's the case about the secret message that's tapped out by hopping poultry. That's the dancing hen. I can't. I cannot abide. <laughs> Holy cow! Uh, that one certainly laid an egg. Oh dear, no doubt. Uh, you were well, not even close, really. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me let me um, let me help you out. It's the problem of Thorbridge. Oh, what a yeah. problem! Yeah, our friend Eric Deckers once again came to the rescue. He said it's the story of the time that Sherlock Holmes called Moriarty on the phone to antagonize him and ask him if his icebox was running. It's the problem with your fridge. Immedia <laughs> immediately afterward, Holmes rescued Prince Albert from imprisonment <laughs> in his can. Wait, wait, that's not it, Eric writes. It's the problem of Thorbridge. Oh, the <laughs> yes, problem of Thorbridge. That is correct. Well done, Eric. Well done. So I guess we need to bring out the big prize wheel and give it a spin. There it goes, round and round, ending on number 27, number 27. And that corresponds to Robert S. Hanmer. Robert, congratulations, and thank you so much for that entry. We will be sending you a DVD copy of uh, Peter Cushing in the Sherlock Holmes collection from uh, the BBC. Our nod to the silent films. We thought we'd add a little sound uh, to the prize this time around. Well, speaking of prizes this time around, we have a copy of the Sherlock Holmes scrapbook edited by Peter Haining. It appears on the Shaw 100, and it is your prize for answering this canonical couplet. Holmes exhausted Palmer, and then Dunlop told him more. A forbidden squalid inn displayed a gamecock at the door. If you know the answer to this canonical couplet, put it in an email addressed to comment at IHearOfSherlock.com with canonical couplet in the subject line. If you are among all of the correct answers and we draw your name at random, you'll win this prize. Good luck. Ah, oh, boy, oh boy, Bert. <laughs> hard to believe, isn't it? It is hard to believe. I can't believe it. I can't believe it either. Okay, that was fun. Now let's do it again and record it. Oh, oh, good times, good times. Well, the good news is uh, today, the fifteenth, is a Wednesday, and if you haven't ha if you haven't had your fill of Sherlockian podcasts, you can get over to Trifles and listen to us pontificate over there about one short subject or another. So, in the meantime, I can't believe this isn't Bert Wolder. <laughs> well, that's because I'm very seldom Scott Monty. Oh, perfect. And together we say... The, the Games, games 
a foot. foot. <laughs> the, the game's a foot. You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I am neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes.